Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we'll solve some multiple choice problems that you will find on page number 71. Page 71 beginning with 61. Let's get going, shall we? Number 61 says that uh, A is greater than 0 and B is greater than A and C is greater than B. The question is which must be true? The word here is must, not which of the following may be true, must be true. And there are three statements that are given to us. The first statement says 2 times a is greater than b plus c. The quickest, the easiest, the most economical way here to tackle this thing instead of dealing with algebra is to just plug in some numbers. Any numbers would do. They have to be greater than 0 and it doesn't say it doesn't, it doesn't put any other restrictions, so we're just going to put down 1, 2, 3. If we do that, 2 times 1, it says it's greater than 2 plus 3, which it is not, which is statement, num statement number 1 is not true. Statement 2 says that C minus A is greater than B minus A. As you can see, if we add A to both sides, what, it, what we end up with here is, what we end up here is C is greater than B, which is exactly what it says here. C is greater than B. So statement 2 works. Statement 3 says that C over A is less than B. C over A is less than B. If you multiply, if you multiply both sides by A, A is going to drop out. And we can do that because they're both all positive. And this says C is less than B. Or rather C is, C is greater than B here. It says C is greater than B, which is exactly what it says here. C is greater than B. But here it's just the opposite, it says C is less than B, which is not true. Which is not true. So the answer is 2 only. 2 only, which is answer choice B. 2 only. Next one. Number 62. Just give me one second here. I did not get my thing ready to, to erase the blackboard. I have to do it right now. It's a high tech thing that I do. There we go. This is superior technology. I should get a pattern on it. Number 62. It says the, that uh, we have a line here. It goes to the origin and it looks something like this. This is R, S. The coordinates of this point are R and S. We are told that the origin, origin 0 is the midpoint. It's the midpoint of this line. And on the other end, we are given the other point, R, or rather, uh, we are given the other point, and we are, being, uh, we are being asked here, what are the coordinates of the other points? If the coordinates of P are R and S, what are the, co what are the coordinates of Q? This is P, what are the coordinates of Q? This is a very straightforward This is a very straightforward problem, there is not really much to do. It's very simple. If this is R and S, for example, if this was positive 3 and positive 5, as we come down here, uh, I'm explaining too much here, it's, gonna be, it's just going to be negative 3 and negative 5. It's just going to be negative 3 and negative 5, which means negative r and negative s. The coordinates of q are negative r and negative s. There is not much I can do here because there is not much to do. Number 63. Some are just too bloody silly. 63. 63 is going to require some work. It says which one has the greatest 
standard deviation which one there are five groups that are given to us the question is which of which one of these five group has the greatest standard deviation as I always remind you it is important it is vital it is essential it is absolutely crucial that you have the book in front of you so that you can follow the work because I don't put down everything on the blackboard read the book and you will understand what they're talking about there standard deviation let's talk about what standard deviation is what is standard deviation measure standard deviation measures standard deviation measures measures dispersion around mean around mean around average it tells you it tells us it tells us how spread out how spread out the observations are from the mean how, how straightforward they are how spread out the observations are from the mean and the way we do that is we take the observation whatever the observation is and we subtract it from the mean this is the mean here the mu the Greek letter mu and we square it this is the this is this is how far it is from the mean we square the difference and we take the sum of it now technically we have to take divided by the number of observation which we're not going to do here we don't have to divide by the number of observation in each case because all five cases that we're going to look at they all have four observations since they all have the same number of observation and it's not going to play any role so this is what we're looking for the sum of the deviation from the mean sum of the deviations from the mean which means the very first thing we're going to have to do is figure out the mean of these five group of numbers that I'm about to put on the blackboard the first one is A it says 45 55 50 and 55 50 what's the mean here? we don't have to do it in a traditional way where we add up four numbers and divide by four like a child just look at it this is 55 this is 45 if you take a 5 if you take a 5 from this guy and give it to this guy it becomes 50 and that becomes 50 which means the the mean here is 50 i left no room for myself to do any work so the mean of the first group is 50 45 55 50 and 50 and here's our mean which happens to be 50 for the first one and as you can see here as you can see here I'm going to do the work only because it might help you but in a real exam you should be able to just just visual inspection just you should be able to see right away uh, you should be able to see which one has the greatest dispersion around the mean just by visual inspection for example here as you can see, if mean is 50, these two are already 50, which means they do not deviate from the mean at all. This quantity is 0 for this guy and this guy. And this is 5 units from there, and we have to take a square of that. We have to take the square of the thing, which is going to be 5 squared, and this is going to be 5 squared. They are both 5 away from the mean. And when we square them, we are going to get 25 and 25, which means this quantity, let's put it here, this is the mu, which is 50, and here we're going to put down the sum of the deviation from the mean. And for the first guy, it's just 25 plus 25 because this is 0 and this is 0. It's 50. Let's look at the second guy. We are looking for we are looking for the greatest one. Let's look at C. C says 34, 28, 28, and 30. Again. Let's first figure out the mean before we talk about it. This is 30, this is 28, this is 28. This is 2 away from 30, this is 2 away from 30, and this is 4 more than 30. Which means if you were to take a 4 from this guy and give 2 to this and 2 to this guy, they all become 30. The mu here is 30. Let's circle this thing so that we know this is the average. And this is exactly at the, at the mean. Even though these are not at the mean, here we have two observations that were right at the mean. Here only have one observation, but even though there is only one observation, I hope you're able to see this is a very tight distribution. They are all very close to mean. Only two away, only two away, only four away. As opposed to here where there were five away. So if you square the quantities, this will become four, this will become four, this will become 16. It's a 24. It's a 24. 
24. As you can see, that one was 50, this is 24, since we're looking for the greatest standard deviation among the five observations, C is not the answer, because A is more than C. Let's look at D. Let's look at D. D says 39, 42, 41, and, and 38. And this doesn't actually take too long, if we know exactly what we're doing, and if we don't have to explain anything to anybody. Again, don't do it out, don't add them up, this plus this plus this and divide by 4, that takes too long. Just, just visual observation should, should help you here. These questions are not designed in a way where that requires an actual physical calculation a, a lot of the time. Many, many times they are designed in such a way that they just want to see how well you think, not how fast you can calculate. Do you understand? Just look, just observe them. It looks like they all are around 40, so if you want to pretend they are 40, this guy needs, this guy needs to have one. And this guy has two more. So if we take two from here, give one to this guy, and one to that guy. See, we took two away from there, give one to this guy, one to this guy. They are all, this is 40, this is 40. Oh, but this guy needs one more. This is 38, this is 39. So why don't we take one away from this guy and give one to this? There you go. You see, they all become 40. They all become 40. The mean is 40. The mean is not only mean is 40, but as you can see, they are also very close to 40. They're not too far apart. They're not too far away. So if you, if you, Square these quantities, they're going to be very squ small quantities. This is a 2. So 1 squared is just 1, 2 squared is 4, 1 squared is 1, and 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8, it's just 10. This guy is 10. Oh, what do you know? Just 10? Can't be. Unless I made a mistake. Oh, it is 10. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot. We are looking for the greatest standard deviation among the five, not this least standard deviation. If they were looking for the least standard, the question was asking which of the following has the least standard deviation, the answer would have been D. D has the least standard deviation. Number 10, 10 is the smallest one. I know because I've done it already. But we are looking for the greatest one. So D is not the answer because 10 is less than 50. Oh, sorry, rather 40 is less than 50. Oh, it's not 10. 10 was, 10 was the, what the hell was 10? Oh, I'm getting confused here. Mean was 40, mean belongs here. And the sum of the stand, sum of the deviation was 10. So it is right that it is it does have a smaller standard deviation, the least standard deviation, because it adds up to only 10. But since we're looking for the greatest one, D is not the answer. 24 was not the answer. 50 is so far the biggest one. We did the C, we did the D, let's do let's do E. Let's do E. E says. He says 50, 60, 60, and 70. Again, I hope by now we're picking up on it. The average here is 60. Visual observation tells you that it's 60, because all you have to do is take 10 away from this guy and give it to this guy. Now this becomes 60, and this becomes 60, and this is 60, this is 60, which means the mean is 60. Mean is 60. How far away from 60 are they? This guy is 10 away. If you square the 10, you're going to get 100. This part that we're doing is the square of the deviation from the mean. This is what the, that's what this is. This this the average is 60 and this is at 60, so it's zero. Average is 60 and this is at 60, so that's deviation is zero. And this is 10 units away from 60, which means if you square it, it will be 100. So it's 100 plus 100 is 200. 200. Oh, now this guy is more than 50. E is more than A, which means A drops out. So what is the answer? Is the answer E? No, the answer is not E. Answer is the letter that I left out on purpose. What I left out was B. Let's take a look at B. Answer is not. Answer is not E. It is, we'll see in a second, is B. I left it until the very end because I want you to be able to see right away just by looking at it that it is very dispersed from the mean. It's far away, the observations are too far away from the mean. Not only they're too far away, but in this case, not a single observation is sitting right at the mean. Here, you see, the mean was 60, we have two observations of 60, the mean was 40, they're all very close to 40. And before, in answer choice A, the mean was 50 and there were two observations sitting at 50. In B, you will find that none of the observations, not only they're too far away from the mean, but not a single observation is exactly equal to mean. They're all different, which means they're all dispersed from the mean. Let's take a look at it. B. It says 10. 30, 30, and 10. So what's the mean here? What is the mean here? It's very straightforward. Just take away, 
10 from this guy and give to this guy. If you take away 10 from this guy, what does it become? He becomes a 20. This quantity becomes 20. And this quantity becomes 20. Same thing here. Take away 10 from this guy, give it to this guy. They are all 20 now, which means the mean is 20. The mean is 20. And how much does it deviate from the mean? As you can see, they all deviate. The mean is 20. This guy is 10 units away from the 20. This is 10 away from 20. This is 10 units. They are all far away from the mean. If you square the 10, you're going to get 100. Another 100 for this 10. Another 100 from this 10. Another 100 for this 10. And it turns out the sum of the sum of the deviation is 400. This guy was only 200. This is the largest one. The answer is B. The standard deviation for the group B is the largest one. Do you understand? Don't have to waste our time dividing by four. Technically, we should divide this by number of observations, but we don't have to waste our time for that because they all have four observations. It would have played no role. Do you understand? Because we simply want to establish which one has the greatest standard deviation. We don't care if the calculation is not precise. Every one of those quantities we saw was four times the amount that it should have been, which is fine. 64. 64. 64 says that uh, we are selling something. We are selling something where the price is two dollars per unit. I'm not going to re read the entire bloody thing to you, you read it yourself. We are told that the variable cost, variable cost we are told is 40% of price. 40% of price. Fixed cost we are told is $5,040. That's the fixed cost per run. Every time we run a production, every time we turn the machine on and we run a production, it cost, it, there is a certain fixed cost of around $5,000. The question simply is, what is the, what is the break-even point? What is the break-even point, the magic number of units that we have to sell so that we do not lose money, nor do we make any money. So we won't make any profit, but at least we won't lose, lose any money either. We won't have any loss, we'll just break even. Let's find out, shall we? First thing first, the variable cost we are told is 40% of price. We know what the price is. Price is $2. 40% of $2 is how much? 10% of $2 is 20 cents. 40% is going to be 80 cents. So this variable cost that we see there is actually 80 cents per unit. Remember that. It is 80 cents per unit because that, that's what works out to be. The 40% 40, 40 of $2 works out to be 80 cents per unit. Let's set it up, shall we? Since we want a break even point, we want our revenue to be equal to our cost. And it says cost, plural, because we have a fixed cost and a variable cost. So if we're going to sell n units. We're going to sell n number of units and we want to find out what that magic number is. And if we sell n unit, each one of them for two dollars each, we're going to get two times n dollars. Makes sense, doesn't it? And that has to equal to the 80 cents per unit cost that we have, the variable cost, 80 cents per unit for n units, plus the fixed cost, which is $5,040. $5,040. We just have to solve that equation for n, and that's our break-even point. That's how many units we have to sell in order to break even. Let's do it on the top. the top but I need a small tiny break because my throat is hurting. Let's set it up on the top. 2 times n equals 0.8 n plus 5040. Let's bring let's bring this n to the other side 2 minus point 0.8 is going to give us 1.2 n equals 5040. 5040. Let's multiply. Let's multiply. This is 1.2. Don't miss that. Let's multiply both sides by 10. Let's multiply both sides by 10 so we can get rid of this 1.2. It becomes 12 n equals 5040 with 1 0 and 2 0, which I'm going to write that as 100. This 10 becomes 100. I just take a 0 from here, put it here. Do you understand? 
Now all we have to do is divide the two sides. Let's, let's, let's start, shall we? Let's, let's, let's divide by... Let's divide by... What can we divide by? Let's divide by 4. This is a multiple of 4, that's a multiple of 4. If you divide both sides by 4, this becomes 3. How many 4s does 5 have? 5 has 1 4. Stay, stay with me in the story. It's very important that you stay in the story. How many 4s does 5 have? 5 has 1 4. After we take away 4 from the 5, we have a remainder of 1. What happens to that 1? 1 goes and joins the 0 and becomes a 10. And 10 has 2 4s. 2 4s are 8. After we take away 8 from the 10, we have a remainder of 2. What happens to the 2? 2 goes and joins the 4 and becomes a 6. And 6 has... Uh, uh, joins the 4 and that becomes 24. And 24 has 6 4. 6 4 is 24. Let's divide both sides by 3. How do we know this is divisible by 3? If the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, the number is divisible by 3. 1 plus 2 plus 6 is 9. Since the sum, SUM sum, of the digit is divisible by 3, this number is divisible by 3. Let's divide by divisible by 3. Besides, we can clearly see it's divisible by 3. It's 12 and a 6. Let's divide by 3. So 12 has 4 3's and 6 has 2 3's. There you go. 42 times 100. Turns out that we need to sell 4,200 units. If you're going to make a run on, in, in, for this particular unit, we hope that we sell at least 4,200 units. That's where we break even. When we sell 42 and the first 4,200 and first unit, that's going to be our profit. Next one, 65. 65. Let's see what 65 says. 65 says that the initial investment, initial investment was $9,900. $9,900. The cost per unit is 65 cents. And we're going to sell it. We're going to sell it price, we're going to so sell it for, sold for, which that's what the price means, $1.20, $1.20. It costs us 65 cents to make it, it costs us 65 cents to make it, we're going to sell it for $1.20, but that difference is not our profit because we have to also account for the fact that there is a fixed cost involved of almost $10,000. Again, same thing. We're looking for the break-even point. That E should not have been capital because it is not a new word, it's hyphenated, break-even point. Let's, let's do the same thing as we did before. So let's pretend that we're going to sell N units. If we sell N units, each one of them for $1.20, we should get $1.2 for each unit times the N units. This is our revenue. This is our revenue. And here we're going to put down the cost. We have two kinds of cost. We have the initial investment, which is the fixed cost. So we have our fixed cost, which is the initial investment of 9,900, plus the variable cost, which is the cost per unit of 65 cents. 65 cents per unit, and we're going to sell N units. And we want to find out what that N is. Let's do it out, shall we? Again, let's do it on the top. So we have 1.2 N equals 0.65 N right here plus 9900. Subtract 0.65 N from both sides. 0.6, if, if, if this had been 0.6, 1.2 minus 0.6 would have been exactly 0.6, so it's going to be 0 0.55. 0.55n because it is 6.5. Because it is 0 0.65 equals 9900. Are you with me? Let's multiply both sides by 100. So we can get rid of this 0.55 business. So we end up with 55n equals 9900 times 100. Let's write that down because it is 9900. I'm going to write that down exactly like that. 9900 times 100. Are you with me? 
Let's divide. The, oh, there you go. It's, it's very easy actually. Let's divide both sides by 11. If you divide both sides by 11, this becomes 5 and this becomes 11. Oh, this is too simple. And now we have a 5 and we have a 100. Let's divide both sides by 5 and this becomes 20. And that's all there is. That's all there is. But that is not the answer what I have here. I'm getting something very different. Oh, if we divide by 11, if we divide by 11, oh, that's how, that's how I wrote the 11 here, because we were dividing both. If we divide 55 by 11, we get a 5, but if we divide 99 by 11, we get a 9, not an 11. I wasn't paying attention. It's a good thing I checked my work, because I have a different answer there. So there we go, we're done. So here we go. 9 times 9 times 2 is 18, and then we have 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0. Well, I shouldn't put a comma there, but it doesn't really matter. Yes, 18. Yes, comma is fine. Just because it's not money, we can still put a comma. So again, in this case, we need to sell 18,000 units to break even, unlike the previous example, where we had to sell 4,200 units. Let's do 66. 66. Sixty-six is the very last one on the page, and sixty-six says, "Where, where will the dial stop if it is rotated clockwise from S and is rotated through?" 1174 intervals and what is the dial that is given to us looks something like this it is how many so there we go I'm going to draw the best I'm going to draw as best as I can there we go this is s we are told that this is s this is where we're going to we're going to grab it and we're going to rotate it clockwise. We're going to turn it clockwise so that it goes through 1174 intervals. This interval has no name. This one they're calling A. This is called B. This is called C. This is called D. And this is called E. And that one has no name. This one has no name and that one has no name. And if you're curious, why these two have no names is because there are only five answer choices. There are only five answer choices A, B, C, D, and E. That's why they did not name these two. That's exactly that's the reason why they did not christen. This is R, C H R I S T and Christen. We learned this thing, we learned this word in our vocabulary lessons a long time ago. If you're one of those people, who follows my vocabulary videos. If you are interested in improving your vocabulary, you will find the vocabulary videos on my channel. Just type in GRE vocabulary words and I'm going to tell you which way, if I can very quickly find it, Christen, since it's cropped up. It doesn't hurt to improve the vocabulary if I can find it very quickly. If not, then I'll tell you next time. Oh, there we go. Day number 63. What do you know? Vocabulary day 63. Watch the video where we're going to learn what Christen means. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words day 63, and if the video does not pop up, anytime you're searching for something and you type in a topic and it doesn't pop up, put in my name next to it. Vocabulary words, G GMAT vocabulary words day 63, and then put, put Keshwani and you'll find it. So, that's the reason why they, they did not name these two points, they did not christen them, because there are only five other choices. So what do we do here? It's very simple. We want to go through 1174 intervals, and it has eight intervals altogether. You see there are four quadrants and each has two. One, two, and then this is a new one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So let's divide this quantity by eight to find out, to find out how many how many intervals, how many, how many revolutions will go through, how many complete revolutions will go through. Let's divide it. Uh, should I do it here? Let's do it here. 
Let's divide by 8. Okay, stay with me in the story, it's very important. How many 8 does 1 have? 1 has no 8. 1 has no 8. What happens to that 1? 1 goes and joins the other 1 and becomes an 11. 11 has 1 8. After we take away 8 from the 11, we have a remainder of 3. What happens to the 3? 3 goes and joins the 7 and becomes a 37. And how many 8 does 37 have? 37 has 4 8. 4 is a 32. 4 8 is a 32. After we take away 32 from 37, we have a remainder of 5. What happens to that 5? That 5 goes and joins the 4 and becomes a 54. And how many 8 does 54 have? 54 has 6 8. 6 8 is a 48. And after we take away 48 from the 54, we'll have a remainder of 6. Now I'm going to do the same division, but longhand, in case you have trouble following me. We're going to do the same division, but longhand. That's which is why I was debating whether or not I should have done it here. Uh, I don't want to erase this either, but let's see if we can do the long division someplace. We can squeeze it someplace. Maybe we can squeeze it here. 1174 divided by 8, so that you can have a contrast. Let's begin, shall we? Let's begin, let's begin, how many 8 does 1 have? 1 has no 8s. What happens to that 1? That 1 goes and joins the other 1 and becomes 11. 11 has 1 8. After we take away 8 from the 11, we have a remainder of 3. What happens to that 3? That 3 goes and joins the 7 and becomes a 37. It, that 3 goes and joins the 7 and becomes a 37. And 37 has 4 8s. 4 8s are 32. After we take away 32 from the 37, we have a remainder of 5. What happens to that 5? That 5 goes and joins the, six, joins the 4, joins the 4 and becomes a 54. And 54 has uh, 54 has 4 8. 4 8 is a 32. Four, uh, not 4, rather 6. 6 8. 6 8 is a 48. 6 8 is a 48. And we have a remainder of 6. We have a remainder of 6. So what does the 6 tell us? Which means that we're going to make, we're going to keep making complete revolution starting from S. We're going to keep making complete revolution, 146 revolution, and that will bring us here. And we still have 6 more intervals to go in order to make 100, in order to go through 100, in order, in order for us to go through 1174 intervals, we have to go six more, six more, six, six more intervals, six, six more units. So we are here right now. So let's count them. I'm going to change the color so we can see them. We're going to change it. We're going to stop. One. This is the remainder. Remainder of six. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, voila! This is our answer. The answer is E. The question was, where will we stop? The answer is, will we stop at E, which is just a which is just as well because we were running out of letters. The answer is E. Answer is E. This is the end of the page. This is the end of the page and typically I stop right here at the end of the page but I'm going to do one more because uh, this number 67 for some reason happens to be on the same page in my notes as the one that I just finished and if I don't do it right now I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that next time when we meet I might forget to do 67 from the previous page and I don't want to do that. So let's cover 67 which is the very first problem on the next page. 67 says, we have a 67, it says 181 is approximately what percentage? You see I need, I don't want to do this thing, I need to squeeze the whole line in one shot. Otherwise it won't work. Let's erase all of this thing we are done now. One hundred and eighty-one is approximately what percent greater than seventy-nine? That's the question. And keep in mind that we are looking for the approximation. This is a very important word. When we see the word approximate, we mustn't do unnecessary work because they are not looking for precision. They are giving us the license, they are giving us the permission to take liberties. So that's what we're going to do. So let's pretend, let's pretend that this 180, 181 is actually 180. So we can, even though the question says 181 is approximately what percentage is greater than 79, we're going to read it as 180 is approximately 
what percentage greater than 80? Are you with me? That makes it simpler. So let's let's take a look at it. You see we have 180. 180, I hope you will agree, is same as 160 plus 20. Right? And 160, if you compare 160 to 80, if you compare 160 to 180, that's double of that. 160 is exactly 100% greater. 160 is exactly 100% greater than 80. And 20 is one fourth of 80, so it is 25% more, 25% more. In other words, 180 is 125 percent greater than 80. 180 is 125 percent greater than 80, which makes sense because 180 is uh, 100 percent of 80 is 80, 25 percent of 80 is 20, 80 plus 20 is 100, which is exactly what it is. 180 is 100 more than 80. 80 plus 20. That was it. That was the end of our video today. Number 67, as I told you, is from the next page. I'll meet, I'll see you tomorrow, where we'll pick up from the data sufficiency problem where we left off yesterday. If you want to get hold of me, if you find this helpful and if you'd like to work with me, if you want to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the GMAT, you can reach me at Keshwani Prep, that's P-R-E-P, Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Send me an email, we'll see what we can do. Alright, bye now.